Hi, this is Steve Hargadon, and it's our weekly chat with Audrey Waters from Hack Education. What's going on in the world of education? And Audrey, you've been a little hot under the collar lately. <laughs> I know. Has that continued? <laughs> well, I, you know, this this week has been this week has continued. Although I wouldn't say I've quite um, raised to the ire that um, either um, Apple or Pearson have over the last couple of weeks, but I I still think the uh, the the rage continues, right? Well, su- surprisingly enough, Apple and Pearson are in some stories this week, so mm-hmm. I'm sure we'll get there. Yes. Um, I actually found myself uh, surprisingly passionate about a couple of these stories, so so we'll we'll take them as they come. Um, the The first post of last week or of this week was uh, "This is why we fight." Yeah. And you're referring to uh, some of the observations that you made um, at Educon. Um, tell tell me what we're uh, uh, what are we missing when we think about youth capability, and what did Educon help remind you of? Well, I mean, for one thing, you know, it's funny how um, a lot of grown-ups can talk about education technology and never once mention kids, never mention students, never mention um, what's, you know, sort of the, 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 the really what's what we're supposed to be thinking about and working towards improving, which is um, kids, you know, the, the lives, the lives, um, the opportunity for kids. And the, the the students who organize SLA, um, as much as sort of SLA is a great place for us grown-ups who, you know, to sort of reconnect with one another, I just continue to be amazed by the students there. Um, that they, you know, they put together this conference. They have 500 teachers come to their school. And, you know, we educators, we can sort of be a critical bunch sometimes. And, they're, and the students are able to be very poised and show us around, sort of argue they make a good case for why SLA operates the way it does um, institutionally, but I also think they make a very good case about why they're in charge of their own learning and in charge of their own futures in a really powerful way that I don't, I mean, I don't often hear sort of much older college age kids be able to articulate that quite so clearly, let alone, I mean, I, I talked with a freshman this week and she was able to, she was able to really articulate what it was about um, her decision to, to her decision to come to SLA and what she was already sort of um, finding her way at the school in a really really powerful um, and something that you unfortunately I just don't think a lot of schools really give kids that opportunity to to be leaders in that way. So having participated um, as a homeschooling parent. Um, It doesn't surprise me as much because I've seen that level of capability, but I think there was more to it than that. I think there was uh, a sense also that they sort of see the institution as something they're significantly a part of, right? I mean, I was in one session where um, I think it was Jeff, you know, raised his hand and was talking about why they had let the librarian go. Mm-hmm. And the, it was the we. Why had we let the librarian go? And it was a very thoughtful response to this issue of why they had let the librarian go. But it wasn't, this is what the school did. It was, this is what we've done. Yeah, and I think that, I mean, I think that this notion of sort of, you know, that the students do feel as though they they are not just sort of the objects of the education at SLA, that they really are active sort of subjects um, they're sort of like the subjects moving through the moving through the school, not sort of the objects that get filled with you know filled with knowledge in the classroom and then sent out into the world. They really do have ownership over um, over over what happens there in, in a in a way that is I think really important and really different. For me, Educon always ends up being a little um, bipolar, right? There's this. Uh, sort of brilliant showcase of how the process of the school allows for that engagement at all levels. And at the same time, there are all these discussions about how do you take those practices and mandate them either nationally or, or on other schools. And I always leave sort of feeling like we're missing the picture. The picture is that this is a community that builds and you're not going to build exactly the same way, but Chris and his staff and the students have built an educational community, and that's the value. Yeah, I think that that's I think that's really important. And I was actually struck by um, um, talking with um, several other you know f- folks who come from um, cities much like Philadelphia that are really struggling with um, financial struggles, poverty, violence, and see. And it, it's interesting to see the 
the think rethinking what school and community can do is is a the power of transforming sort of not just you know, sort of what we talk about in terms of like kids' futures, but really involving and transforming the the community as well. So I don't think that you can sort of take the SLA model and sort of um, to sort of turn it into sort of the KIP, the KIP model, right, where you have these little um, sort of cookie cutter um, institutions all over the country. I think that it very much is a local community community based solution. That's not, which isn't to say you know other folks can't do similar things, but I just don't think that it's not something that we can sort of quote scale um, or replicate in in a, in an easier in an easy way. I think we're going to get to talk about cognitive temptations, but I think that's one. That's this temptation to say, oh, what are the practices? If we could just do those practices somewhere else, it'd be better. And what I love about Chris Lehman and that whole story is that it's a very human story. And the replic- and like you said, I think the replication is in, in that um, um, community building. Okay, so um, – uh, for the first time, I'm going to use a word to describe what happened on one of your posts, and it's a brouhaha. <laughs> uh, <laughs> you posted about uh, two research reports that came out, yes, um, and um, uh, then had uh, an expert uh, sort of talk to us about um, what is a, what is uh, appropriate and um, good research, and then you got responses back from the researchers. Uh, what did we learn when all was said and done? <laughs> this was real. This was this was a very um, interesting experience for me. Uh, to, partially to sort of to back it up, I met Alicia Chang, who's a cognitive psychologist um, working at a startup called Airy Labs, um, several months ago, and I'd been talking to her and partially responding to a story that Matt Richtel wrote in the New York Times about how about um, that there's sort of quote no there's no proof, there's no scientific proof that shows any of these ed tech um, software, uh, that software sort of doing anything for teaching and learning. And I, and Alicia and I were talking about sort of how do you, like, what happens when scientific research gets translated into the media and then mistranslated to the media perhaps or by the media and then sort of what do people take what's people's takeaway particularly when there's headlines that say you know this proves you know, we've proven that this piece of software um, improves math scores or or improves learning, and so um, and partially part of the part of the impetus behind the story when it when it finally sort of was written was that Wired magazine wrote just just that sort of um, just that sort of sort of misconstrual of scientific research, which said you know we've got proof now that the iPad the iPad is a good learning tool, and they cited two two um, two pieces of research, neither of which appeared in a peer-reviewed scientific journal. They were both white papers paid for by the companies in question. And it just seemed like a good time to cir- circle back around with Alicia and say, yeah, we should, we should clarify sort of what should we look for when, when it comes to evaluating uh, scientific research. And so, you know, I asked Alicia a set of questions. I thought that she responded really well. And she helped, you know, she pointed to some of the things in both of these studies that were um, potentially problematic, and that might might raise questions about. Certainly, if they were um, to to go into a peer reviewed journal, questions that other scholars would ask ask about them. And the response from um, from the researchers in question, they were very upset that uh, that 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 the research was um, challenged in that way. I was sort of taken aback. Not really, but sort of. <laughs> Well, I found myself. I, um, I have a skin disorder called vitiligo, and so, um, and I run a network for people with vitiligo. And one of the things I'm constantly sort of fighting are the people who come in and claim a cure in the network. And uh, and I'm sort of consistently telling the story. If there's not a double blind study, you know, <clears throat> then I'm not even going to look at it, right? Because it's just a claim. So clearly, we have to be careful, sort of, in how we evaluate things. But as so. I looked at that article and I was really drilling down on all the details. And then I kind of came to the finish and I said, wait a minute, have I missed the forest for the trees? Right? The, the question of uh, iPads increasing um, energy or interest or engagement in the classroom, I'm not sure I even need to go to scientific studies to say that's likely to happen just because the devices are cool. Right. Well, I mean, I think that that's... 
Yeah, I mean, I think that there are lots of sort of uh, sort of lots of questions around this, and I and I think that the but I think that we get you know we get swept up by the coolness of the of whatever gadget, whether it's or, or technology, and we quickly look for we look for the studies that sort of confirm that. And I think that the that the media and it isn't just I mean it isn't certainly isn't just around education technology. Um, I think that you can look at the way in which a lot of scientific research is reported on, that it, it gets, like, things, you know, things really don't necessarily um, translate from from the scientific journal into the mainstream media. And I think, you know, I think that that's, that, that's, a, that's can, be, can be very dangerous. Well, we also know, I think, that even in science, um, it's often difficult to replicate what are really well cared for studies, um, and and there is question. There are a lot of questions about just even regular science work that gets reported in those professional journals, but clearly much more carefully done. Um, it, uh, is it worth separating out the piece of bringing in current technology and the fact that that would increase engagement with actual shifts in learning? Is that are, are you able to actually parse that out at all? Well, I think that this is, you know, this is where, it, I mean, I think that all of these things get really muddied. And in fact, I think that there's like several other sort of, if I had interviewed other, you know, someone other than um, Alicia Chang, I think I could have had very different things that people, um, that people were interested at, in and in, in looking at. Um, it was funny, at Educon, I actually attended a session run by uh, John Becker that was talking about action research and how teachers in the classroom should be seen as researchers and what happens in the classroom often isn't sort of recognized as valid research. And so in some ways, I think that in some ways there's so many different, so many different ways in which sort of culturally we privilege one set of, um, sort of one set of methods. Um, and then, you know, questions of the peer review, like is, you know, is the peer review necessarily, um, the, as, perhaps truthful at, or as, as, good a, as good a tool for finding what's the best research. Um, and so I think it's, it's a lot more complicated. And actually, um, certainly my point in helping people unpack, <laughs> unpack you know, what happens in, you know, what happens in scientific research, I felt like that story was a, was a gross failure. Oh, I, I didn't feel that way. I, I enjoyed the, <laughs> the dust up. Okay, so... Uh, Clearly, there's a little bit of Kool-Aid drinking around the iPad, but I think they're manufacturing the Kool-Aid at Stanford, right? I mean, this, uh, this, m these massive courses now a second startup. Yeah, this right? is really and interesting. Is this drinking Kool-Aid? This is I I have I tried so hard to be the good investigative journalist to like get someone at Stanford to talk to me about what was going on because. Whatever happened, sort of behind closed doors, that made that 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 made sort of one group of people go and build one one startup for, to make a massive online learning system, and another group build a competitor a competitor startup. And I do think that Stanford has financial stake in in one of these. Um, you know, there's some really interesting things of thinking about um, sort of the role of the institution um, in innovation and certainly you know Sebastian Thrun's argument is that sort of Stanford is Stanford was sort of standing in the way of innovation and what he wanted to do you know he can do this sort of without without the the blessing and branding of the university um, the other two professors seem to have the blessing of Stanford and are now selling the system to other universities as well so um, it's really interesting Okay, I was really taken aback by the material from from uh, Kohler and and is it pronounced Ng? Yes. How do you pronounce that? Yes. Ng. Yeah. Okay, because there was this sort of uh, the students will deeply learn the material, <laughs> and I was like, really? How can you guarantee? I mean, you're you're massively increasing the number of students. You're significantly de decreasing face time. How how are you now sort of guaranteeing that they deeply learn the material in a way that that doesn't happen in a traditional place? That felt like market speak to me. And I mean, and uh, it, 
it's going to be really interesting to see sort of how this plays out in terms of um, which courses, you know, which courses work well in um, in these sorts of settings. I mean, I think that it's no surprise, right, that we have, you know, Thrun taught artificial intelligence. Um, these are machine learning classes. These are definitely um, very tech heavy algorithm focused classes. Um, but, you know, and so what, what, is gonna, what, what are the implications going to be when these are the classes that we can sort of um, dis distribute at such a mass scale? What are the implications for other disciplines that, I mean, I, you, know, if you've, you know, if you teach a literature class and you have more than sort of, you know, 20 students in your, in your class, it, it gets unwieldy. I can't imagine, you know, 100 and, well, okay. Maybe it would be a, it would be a beautiful thing actually if 160,000 people wanted to sign up and take a free a free class in um, you know 19th century Jane America. Austen. So maybe I shouldn't complain. Right. <laughs> well, the other question that came to me was, the, I think they also talk about using world leading educators. And again, it was this sort of the idea of this inflated value of the perfect or best lecture that somehow by capturing the best and broadcasting it widely, we're going to be doing a better job than if we actually kept things at a smaller scale. Well, this is, I mean, I think that this is always the, this is always the value proposition of a um, university like Stanford or uh, Berkeley, right? This is why, this is why you choose, I mean, it, well, I mean, this is part of the reasons why, why you of the appeal of those schools is, you know, purportedly Harvard, Yale, you know, Stanford, they do have supposedly the best teachers in the world. Um, so I think it's tapping, it's tapping into part of the legacy that, that um, institutions have always sort of sold. Uh, but I think that it's, it, to me, it seems, you know, to both for very interesting times ahead in thinking about what does it mean what does it mean when anybody can sort of have access to, um, it's sort of like MIT OpenCourseWare 2.0, because you have access to the content, but now you have access to sort of the, the video lectures, and you can have your homework graded by, the, by robot, robot graders <laughs> again, too. But you're right. I mean, there's, you know, I think that the, what's missing here is, um, or what, what the students will probably build are their own their own networks of sort of peer to peer learning and sharing, and I think that that's always been an important part of what happens um, in any you know in any setting. And so there still seems to be challenges lying ahead, you know, the, the moving moving beyond just sort of how can we get them, you know, how can we get our lectures to hundreds of thousands of students? It's really sort of how we can get hundreds of thousands of students to uh, collaborate and work together. I think you've done a nice job of framing the difference between how institutions position themselves and what they actually provide, meaning you're going to have access to the best faculty, but in fact, you're actually going to be taught by grad students, mm -hmm. or you're, you know, you're, and, and in fact, those best faculty aren't necessarily the best teachers, right? Right. They may, they may just be the best known, you know, so there's the, there's, there is what's, um, intended to for us to perceive and what actually takes place. I wonder if the same thing will be true with these courses. And I wonder if their their dependence on sort of the autodidact market, people who are able to learn in this way, won't actually mean that they become a bridge to complete independence. Complete independence for, for the from faculty. these institutions. Yeah, I mean meaning I, Yeah, I mean it, that I think that that's that certainly seems to be one very logical outcome of, of all of this too, particularly, you know, particularly if you are able to have, if, if you do have a reputation that um, precedes you, in, you know, in, in uh, outside the university, if you aren't just sort of a Harvard professor, but you are, um, you know, oh, I, I can't actually think of a Harvard professor's name right now. So um, perhaps, see, that's what I mean. Like the, the branding isn't, in some cases, the branding is in the institution, but if you are the if you are the professor, then I think that this you know this is this is Sebastian Thrun's argument is he doesn't need Stanford. Everyone knows who he is. I'm not even sure you need Sebastian Thrun. That'll be interesting. <laughs> okay, so uh, you went looking for uh, visualization and and then found uh, some really sort of an intriguing contrast uh, between two graphs. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah, what. Well, actually, 
actually what caught my eye was a story um, in a Seattle-based um, a Seattle-based uh, tech blog uh, that was talking about the opening this week of the Gates Foundation has opened a visitor center. And they were talking about the ways in which the, the, the tweets around the Gates Foundation, uh, this person argued, represented the ways in which the, the global health community was very is isolated and passive. Um, that, the, that the tweets from the Gates Foundation were really just pushing out a message and there wasn't a lot of conversation um, between um, the people who were sort of listening on Twitter to the Gates Foundation. And I thought that was really interesting. And so immediately I went to sort of see what this uh, researcher um, sort of poke more and see if, if we could say the same thing about the way in which the Gates Foundation, um, the, the education community um, around the Gates Foundation. And what I found was that he had actually recorded some of the the tweets from Educon, and um, the the comparison between the visualizations, uh, so a visualization of a weekend's worth of tweets from Educon, and a weekend's worth of tweets from the Gates Foundation, are so striking. I mean, really, the you can you can literally see the swirling conversations and the reciprocity and the responses and the sharing going on with the with the educators, and, and not I should say not everyone that was on site either. Lots of the people participating in the conversation weren't, weren't in Philly. Um, whereas the Gates Foundation is very much the Gates Foundation broadcasting outwards with very little, you know, very little uh, conversation going on um, back and forth. The, the Gates Foundation isn't part of a conversation um, and it doesn't really feel as though it's uh, sort of encouraging the, the people who care about um, what it's up to, to, to also sort of give back to a broader conversation. So I know that I tend to take a little bit of a Pollyanna approach to social media and, and institutions and organizations, but it does feel like uh, the role of the institution is going to have to move more towards helping its members connect than broadcasting information. Yes. And I loved, I love that visualization it's, for that I mean, reason. Yeah. That, and you can, I mean, it, you can see, how thick those ties are too. It isn't just, I mean, you know, we can think of some of the people who have, you know, tens of thousands of followers that we know, educators that have tens of thousands of followers on Twitter. And it isn't just those folks who are connected. I mean, it really is the lots of, lots of connections and lots of conversations that tie, that tie the community together um, in, a, in a really powerful way. Okay, so um, when we talked about Pearson's relationship to Startup uh, Weekend EDU, <laughs> um, and then we talked to Khalid uh, about that uh, relationship and our and your concerns in particular and my sort of hesitations, um, one of the responses we got was, well, Pearson doesn't even look at anything that's small. They're not going to be competition for those startups. They're just going to be helpful because they don't even want to touch anything that doesn't have $50 million in revenue already. I'm not sure that's true, given this story about Ali Oop. Well, this was a, you know, this is a, um, I should say, too, that, you know, if if this Startup Weekend EDU thing hadn't occurred, this is not a story I would have normally written about. I mean, I really have very, um, typically, I have sort of very little interest in what companies like Pearson are doing. I don't find them to be particularly innovative. I don't think that they're actually necessarily pushing the conversation forward in ways that I'd like it to go. And so for, for Pearson to release, to, to incubate a startup, they say that this is, this is actually a startup that they've created within the community, um, for them to incubate a startup that's about game-based uh, career, prep, career prep, college prep, uh, it wouldn't have been something that I probably would have written about. Um, but it's, it's absolutely a pitch that I've heard twice now at a startup weekend by someone who, um, who I like a lot and who I've watched him sort of over the course of six months really um, think a lot and work, um, you know, work a lot to sort of figure out how can, how can he use sort of game-based learning to help um, particularly, um, you know, uh, disadvantaged youth become more interested in, uh, in STEM careers. And so I was, uh, I was actually mortified to see that Pearson was Pearson was launching a version of something that I've seen an, an individual entrepreneur sort of struggle 
struggle to build. Um, and partially too, that you know, I see this this gulf as well between the fact that Pearson is charging an exorbitant fee. They're absolutely tapping into the tutoring market, which is you know a billion billion dollar market. The college test prep tutoring market is is big bucks indeed. That's why Pearson bought uh, Tutor Vista. Um, but um, comparing that to to the project that um, Kalima is working on, which was about sort of the kids who would never, who could never afford test prep classes, right? Who could never afford um, to get these special career um, opportunities, and probably didn't even have a you know a college counselor in their school. Um, and that's that's the po- population that he's interested in helping. And so, it, to me, it just again, it represented this this gulf between what Pearson wants to do and what some you know innovative community-based startups are are trying to do. Okay, so I probably came to a very different conclusion about that story than most would, but I'd like to explain it. I actually felt – say his name again. Kalima. Kalima. I actually felt like Kalima is at a great advantage here. So um, I'm not sure I really fully grokked the idea or that I bought into it. But part of what I love about the web is the degree to which the audience um, really helps to shape the product. And how most of the things that we now take sort of for granted on the web, like Twitter or Flickr, didn't start out in their current incarnations. And they and they went through a lot of changes and shifting as their users told them, we don't really care about this. Mm-hmm. We care about some other piece. We don't really care about capturing screen images in our games. We really want to store our photos. So the ability to actually maneuver and shift, it, it probably favors the person who has very little money. And yeah. is bootstrapping because the moment that money is involved, I mean, I, I thought about Alleyoop and I thought, okay, I can see this getting pitched in meetings. I can see people saying this is a really good idea and it's going to work. And, blah, blah, blah. and I can see in 18 months the message saying, oh, we're closing that down. Yeah. Now, I, mean, I could be completely wrong, but, but I also felt as though the, the, the small startup has a flexibility that you actually really need in this marketplace. I, th- I mean, I think so too, and I, I and I would say that you know when I when I uh, gave him the heads up that this was happening, his response was, "Well, good." He said because I've been you know con- trying to convince um, you know investors um, and peeps, you know some people I've, that he's working with, you know his mentors, that it's a good idea, and they've always been sort of lukewarm about it. And he said, "Well, here's you know to him it was sort of validation that what he was working on wasn't a ridiculous idea." Um, but I, you know, I think it's still, and, and I think that you know, but it, you know, will he be at the next startup weekend? Will he want to? Will he want to pitch his product, knowing that the Alleyoop folks are in the audience? I don't know. I don't know. So we're going to talk about the mother of all money changes everything stories in just a minute, which is Facebook's IPO. But money does change things, and, uh, and not always for the better. And, and part of what you and I have both been noticing is that, that as there's been more attention focused on educational technology and education in general, we I think we are seeing some cognitive traps and some of them very much related to the money where yeah. people are talking about their programs or their companies based in all these financial terms but not really in educational terms. So one thing you and I have identified is something that we sort of uh, jokingly call ignoring Papert. <laughs> yes. Right, which is you use this as a litmus test. You I do. Tell me, what, tell us what that is. Well, I mean, if I, you know, if I'm talking to, if I'm talking to someone who says that they're genuinely interested in an education startup, um, and they've never heard of Seymour pa- Seymour Papert, to me, that's that's a pretty that's a red flag that they've not done what is I think the the sort of the minimal amount of due diligence to um, look at the history of what it means to have technology and computers um, in an educational setting. It's, um, to me, it, it's, just, it's just sort of, the, it's sort of one of the, the, little, <laughs> the little Audrey tests to find out if people are really serious about thinking about how technology can uh, reshape the way we learn or if they are in the business of education. So, and I've told you before, I think there's a little bit of a cognitive trap here, which is, I'm not sure this is malicious or conscious, that it's this sense of, I'm coming into something new, and I am I have to believe I know more than I do to actually take action. 
So I think that plays out in a couple of other ways as well, which is doing something not really – um, maybe not uh, uh, um, distinguished from not even studying about the, the history, but also sort of willfully ignoring or not making the effort to find if somebody else is actually already doing something. <laughs> right. Well, and, and this, you know, I mean, I think that that's one of the things that I definitely notice now, particularly because there's this, there's this sense that suddenly, all of a sudden, within the last two years, there's technology in education. Um, which is why, again, which is why uh, Papert is a great litmus test, um, since you know his writing. Is, I mean, it's forty years old in some cases. I mean, this isn't this isn't actually new. Um, I mean, the the technologies, of course, the technologies have advanced, um, um, and perhaps we're even, you know we're actually a lot closer to some of some of the things that he was envisioning with one to one capabilities. The, the notion of using, you know, having computers in the classroom and thinking about the ways in which those, um, those can sort of radically change how we teach and learn. This isn't, this isn't just something that, you know, people discovered when you were able to make math flashcards on an iPhone. So we need to give Gary Steger some credit because he actually has a Papert Daily email. That, that gives quotes from Seymour Papert. And I wouldn't know much about Seymour Papert if it wasn't for Gary Steger. Um, is there another sort of interesting phenomenon here going on as well, which is uh, that the, the social web tends to be a gift economy and a lot of people are coming in and sort of expecting that other people will just produce results for them rather than giving into that economy? I think that, I mean, this is one of the things that I've been thinking about a lot lately, too, um, which is another one of the reasons why I think Khan Academy might be so sort of terribly dangerous, is that Khan, Khan, because Khan Academy is free, um, but not necessarily, I mean, it's, it's not necessarily sort of great teaching, but it's free teaching, but I think it's really so, also sort of skewing what we think about in terms of quality teaching, that instead of wanting sort of um, better, we're going to go with free and sort of the good enough. Um, but I think, I think that's right. I mean, I think that people aren't, I mean, again, going back to that visualization from Educon, you can see that that community is very much about giving um, reciprocity, communication, sharing, um, and not just, not just sort of broadcasting and not just taking. So interesting. Okay, so um, Facebook files for an IPO. Yes. And um, uh, you actually find that Zuckerberg's personal letter speaks to you. I, yes. They, um, I'm, I'm, not a huge, I'm not a huge fan of Facebook um, for a lot of reasons, although I must say that um, I've, I've met Mark, and there's something about – being face to face with a billionaire who has acne that makes it it actually triggers that maternal piece of me that makes it very hard for me to sort of stay <laughs> angry with him. Um, because yeah, you know, I mean, you know, a billionaire in flip flops with zits is sort of not, I, you know, he's he's a sort of affable little hacker. Um, but uh, but I thought that what he had to say was was pretty. Profound, and actually, I think that the Facebook IPO is a really important moment um, for the for the tech industry. Um, and I think that Mark Zuckerberg and what he's done with Facebook um, in terms of sharing uh, is a very important culturally. So I was intrigued by his decision to include in his personal letter as part of the filing a description of the hacker way, which he says is sort of part of the very much part of the ethos of what it means to work at. Um, at Facebook. And I like it. I mean, there's a reason that I, you know, it's funny when I call my blog Hack Education, I get people who comment and say, sort of, are you teaching people how to break into school systems and change their grades? Because there's this, you know, we have this negative connotation of that the hacker, the hacker is the criminal. And I think that what it means to be, uh, what it means to be hack a hacker is a, um, isn't, isn't, just that, I mean, I think that that's sort of the connotation perhaps that things have taken on. But the legacy of, of the hacker is a very different ethos. I think it's one that um, by Facebook becoming more stream, mainstream, I think, has a, has a chance to really change, sort of change culturally, change businesses. Um, it's, it's a different way of thinking about institutions. Um, it's a much more 
open, um, agile uh, uh, way of sort of working, um, rather than sort of having a committee, you know, sort of organizing a committee to talk about how you maybe want to change things. You do it, you, you code it, you throw it out there. Does it work? Does it not work? Um, and you sort of build with your hands, learn on the fly, move quickly, change quickly, and adapt quickly. And I think that that's, that's a model that I think education um, should really look at and think about and learn from. So if, if we are going through a period of, a large, of large-scale deinstitutionalization, right? The restaurant no longer can tell you how good their food is. You, you read other people's reviews. You know, people in Egypt are demanding a voice in governance. But, you know, part of what we're also seeing in Egypt is how hard it is to go from that moment of voice to actually sort of stable structures for incorporating that voice into decision-making. So it's kind of fun to watch a company built on social. Yes. Right, on this very voice. Talk about how they run the company. Well, which is, I mean, in some ways, this is all, I, I mean, I, I, this is, again, this is what's hard about Mark Zuckerberg, because he's just a kid, um, is that I think that he's very genuine about what he means in terms of, he, you know, a, a mission, a social mission, as opposed to making a business. Like, I think that he has sort of, speaking of Kool-Aid, I think he sort of drank his own Kool-Aid um, in some ways. I think that, um, but I think that, you know, I think that he really, I mean, I think he really does want to make the world more um, open. I mean, we can sort of be cynical about that and say, well, sure, because, you know, now you have all of our data and you, you know, you made a uh, billion dollars last year on advertising by running ads on our personal data. Um, so, I mean, I, I won't sort of excuse all of that, but I do think that, I mean, I do think that it marks a pretty interesting shift in terms of rethinking which institutions have been in you know which institutions were powerful but i mean the rise of facebook is a new institution and i don't know that it's one that's necessarily um benign i graduated from college in 1983 a number of my friends went to work for a small company called microsoft <laughs> and became microsoft millionaires and then we've known google millionaires uh will there be some interesting um potential here that that some number of the of the people who who become very wealthy because of Facebook's going public will want to channel that money into this ed tech arena i i think i mean i think that in general this will be the the facebook ipo and the folks who are able to sort of um become sort of some of the employees now who will be mil millionaires at least if not billionaires in some cases i do think that this will be an interesting opportunity for sort of more investment in startups. I think that there is something about the startup world that makes a lot of folks, um, even if you sort of try to maintain a googly workspace or a face, I don't know what the adjective would be, um, a sort of a the Facebook startup mode, I think that people will leave these large companies um, and either create new startups or invest in new startups. Whether or not they'll be education-oriented startups, um, remains to be seen. So one of the most interesting books I've read in the last month was a book called Grouped by a guy who actually works at uh, Facebook and previously worked at Google and helped create uh, Google+. And it's a look at what we're learning about ourselves uh, from the data in terms of how many people we actually socialize with and where those social interactions take place. And part of what I really like about this is it's a recognition. It's sort of getting beyond Taylor into Drucker. It's sort of a recognition of um, uh, um, social and cognitive issues that go beyond sort of the logic of the manufacturing process. And I'm thinking about all these people who would leave an organization that's built on social I'm not saying they're going to leave, but the influence that they might have in terms of bringing that perception or that frame of social into other organizations should be really interesting. And I think education needs this desperately. I think so, too. I mean, this is, you know, I think that we um, – and I shouldn't say – I mean, I, I do care a lot about privacy. I think that privacy is a really important issue, and I, and I don't want to sort of throw caution to the wind and say, well, we should share everything publicly, openly – Forget about, you know, forget about privacy. I mean, Zuck, Zuck said this himself, like, you know, privacy is dead, whatever, get over it. Um, but I do think that education is still really hampered by some very old, I mean, we've talked about this before, some very old laws 
um, FERPA in particular that predates um, predates the internet. Um, and I think that sort of rethinking rethinking privacy and rethinking ownership um, and actually in you know having the the propensity to share and the I would say the sort of obligation to share is is um, fits well I think with sort of the ethos of teaching um, and I think that it would do well for us to to sort of get over some of our concerns about uh, some of our some of our concerns about sort of privacy and control of students data I would say hand it back over to to the students themselves um, but I do think that this I do, th I do think that the the education would do well to to be more social and be more open and be more ready to share I think that um, graphic the the graph from Educon is sort of a good example of how we're seeing at least within educator professional development those educators who've early who early on have adopted these tools, that they now feel very much like their learning is enormously associated with um, uh, with social. Right. That it is social learning. And I, uh, I think we're going to find more and more that that sort of proves itself and that we're going to look for ways of understanding how learning is related to the social and that, that this uh, you know marks a, a very interesting era. Okay, I knew that... Um, uh, we couldn't get through the week without talking about Apple, <laughs> and um, there's <laughs> there are two stories, and uh, maybe we can kind of combine them. But one is the truth about tablets, and the other is a digital textbook push. So, um, w w what did you learn this week? I I'm assuming you took longer than a week to write that school library journal article. But what have you learned about tablets and about digital textbooks that you really want to convey? Well, I think that you know. I as particularly following Apple's textbook announcement a couple of weeks ago, there was just this sort of, a, particularly among people who sort of have no clue what happens at, at sort of at schools and libraries, there was this this idea that sort of we'll give everyone tablets, right? If if if, if students just had tablets, then um, you know everything would be magical and wonderful and um, and and happy. And I think that the reality is that taking these devices, which were are designed for individuals which I think is actually an important for schools, um, but and, and a shift, but they're designed for the sole consumer. They don't, they just don't quite work yet in a large scale deployment um, in a setting like a school or a library. There are just a lot of, there are a lot of issues. I mean, just at the level of sort of syncing, you know, talking to one of the teachers or one of the librarians um, who said, that, you know, she had to, manually sync 200 Kindles and label them and load them each individually with content. I mean, and she did so because she said that the kids love to read on them. I mean, the kids, the kids want to be able to read on, on the Kindle devices, but they aren't designed. They don't work at all well. And it doesn't seem as though, um, despite, you know, despite sort of Apple has a, you know, Apple has an education program. Um, Barnes and Noble have a, 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 a program, but None of them really work well with the needs of a school district, whether it's accepting purchase orders, whether it's how they sync, um, you know, the, the vendor lock-in. There's just so many, there's so many issues still to be overcome before we can say that, that you know, tablets and e-readers are these magical devices that you can just simply hand over to any student and, and they'll have sort of the world of information at their fingertips. So, along with our sort of catchy phrase of uh, "Don't ignore Papert," uh, maybe we should invent another one called "Fire your textbooks." <laughs> yeah, the the text like I, I mean, I do understand actually why there are forces that want us to to keep buying textbooks because they're the textbook industry and um, textbooks are a you know billion dollar um, industry. I mean, I think it's eight billion dollars in every year in K through 12 alone, um, and probably similar at the college level. So this is, this is big bucks. And so when you say, let's get rid of textbooks, there are a lot of, there are a lot of powerful people who are like, oh no, 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 no. Um, let's just digitize them and then they'll be awesome. But I really think that we're at the position, we're at the point now where, um, um, you know, I think we can see that textbooks are part of this older, older, textbooks have a long sort of 
a long history and a long legacy of a particular kind of pedagogy, that, again, back to Papert, that really we don't, need, we don't need that any longer. We don't need a textbook. We don't need to have all of that information sort of sanitized um, and uh, watered down um, for kids, whether or not it's, you know, whether it's uh, at the you know, college level or not. I think that there's so much information out there now that a, that a textbook, textbook more than ever seems like this unwieldy, out-of-date, uh, old form of, of literature. Maybe we can get Mitt Romney to add this to the list of things he would like to fire, right? <laughs> Just get rid of it. You're not doing the job anymore. Fire your textbooks. Okay, so Chicago Public Schools lifts their YouTube ban. Yeah, this is great news. This is, I mean, this is a this is a huge win and something that I mean, we've talked about this uh, a lot. That the filtering, you know, the requirements for what schools actually need to filter under SIPA is is pretty clear. It's objectionable, objectionable material, uh, porn. Um, but mo- but almost every school blocks YouTube, um, and the Chicago Public Schools this week. Um, announced that they were lifting lifting the ban on YouTube, which is a huge win for teachers um, and huge win, I think, for students and their access access to information at schools. So, how are they managing that? Just really good agreements with the users. Um, from what it sounds like, this is actually just the ban has been lifted on for teachers and staff, which again is one of you know. Teachers and staff don't need to have, I mean, SIPA doesn't say block teachers from surfing the web. It says block, you know, we need to monitor what children view. Um, And so what it sounds like is that actually teachers will be able to access it. So I'm not sure that a student, a student's device or perhaps even on the, you know, at a a terminal in the library um, that, that, that YouTube would be accessible. But certainly teachers can now show YouTube videos in their classroom without having to, you know, pirate them. Interesting. Okay, so was President Obama's University of Michigan speech received any better than his State of the Union address? <laughs> Not by me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I mean, I, I'm, I'm really sort of, I'm really befuddled by, by well, I, I'm befuddled and actually sort of angry that, that looking at the race, the, the race to the top model um, and sort of what it's meaning for the K-12 through for sort of forcing public schools to sort of conform to uh, to the Department of Ed policy, and now the president wants to apply race to the top to the college level. I I I, I don't I don't know <laughs> I don't know what he's thinking, but he's arguing that you know I mean clearly you know tuition has gotten incredibly expensive. It's um, for students, but you know the reason, and and now he's saying that he wants to tie federal student aid money to schools that keep tuition costs in check, which sort of ignores the fact that part of the reason why school has got more expensive is that you know, many public universities have had their budgets, their, you know, their, their, their public, their money from, from, uh, state, from state revenue uh, slashed. And so it's, um, it's sort of a strange, uh, a strange solution to, um, to the problem. Tough. Okay, tell me about the Digital Public Library of America platform proposal. So this is something that really this is this is an interesting uh, an interesting initiative to keep an eye on. This is a a group of um, public libraries, um, cultural institutions, universities, um, the Internet Archive. I'm talking about what it what it what what should a digital public library of America look like? In some ways, it, I mean modeled on. Um, but the EU actually has a, a digital portal in this way um, called Europeana, in which they're able to sort of tap into the digital resources across um, uh, across the EU um, and access um, access both sort of content and artwork and and um, through through a web portal. And so, what what would what would a digital public library of this country look like? And they're starting to work on it and build it. And the very first the very sort of first stab at what this will be is is available for release, and you can have a look at the um, if you you know if you're tech savvy, you can sort of have a look at what they've built. You can download the source code. They've populated it with some sort of phony data to see what to see sort of what it's going to 
what it's going to offer. But this is sort of being worked on uh, in part at Harvard, interestingly enough, as to what we've been thinking about in terms of Harvard and the library system. Um, but it's definitely an initiative to keep an eye on. Okay, now it's my turn to be mad. So given that I started Classroom 2.0 in Ning five years ago and did yeah. e uh, education evangelism for them for 18 months and have been a, a huge proponent of Ning, uh, I, this is breaking the user agreement at so many levels for me. Um, because it, it, basically what Ning is saying is if you're not paying anything for your network at all, we're going to turn it off. Yep, it's gone. Right? We're not just going to turn it off. It's going to be gone. That content's going to be gone. So uh, not even archived and available. So, so take a medium in which people have contributed. The value of the platform has been the contribution of the members and say that if you don't pay, the content's going away. This, uh, I, I wonder if it actually breaks the original licensing agreements that we had when we signed up for Ning, but I know that it breaks the social contract. Yeah, this is, I mean, and this was sort of, I mean, I think that, you know, it's been, it's been over a year now since Ning sort of made the announcement that sort of pay up um, and said that they were sort of going to end offering the, the free, the free Nings. That, I mean, I think that so many of us had sort of signed up, signed up for, for even for our, sort of our own uh, sort of family social networks. But this week, uh, folks got the, you know, if you had a Ning that you've never paid for, you got an email um, likely saying uh, two weeks, uh, just, you know, heads up, two weeks, either you pay or it's gone. And there's, you're right, there's not even an option, uh, to my knowledge, to, like, download, export your data. They're gone. Oh, you can do that. You know, you can do that. Oh, there is can. a tool for there's, that. Okay. You can but 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 for me, it's this idea that we're just gonna we're gonna take the data that was visibly publicly available on the web that you contributed, knowing it was publicly available, part of yeah you know whatever community you're contributing to, and it will now be off the web. Yep. Yeah. The, I, I mean, guess I don't get as heated as you. That was the extent of my anger. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so teens are migrating from Twitter to Facebook. Do we have any idea in what kind of numbers? Um, that's still quite small. The and the the Pew the Pew Internet uh, the the Pew Internet Center has done some some interesting. I mean, they always do. I think really interesting research, and the the numbers are still quite small. Um, uh, in terms of sort of where teens are, you know, Facebook or Twitter, but they are they are making significant moves to Twitter in part because they feel as though it offers them more privacy. Um, they can use pseudonyms. They don't, they can sort of, they can, uh, they don't have to sort of be friends with their parents and they can block people who try to follow them. So it's an interesting, I mean, I think that, you know, I think as much as, as much as sort of Facebook in some ways has become sort of the, the go-to site for social, it will be interesting to see sort of how long it remains it remains that. I mean, nothing, you know, nothing, nothing stays that way forever. And I think teens, teens are sort of the, sort of an early signal of, you know, leaving MySpace, leaving Facebook, and the fact, and, you know, the, the fact that they find Twitter an interesting place to move to is, um, I think it's, it's, it's pretty significant. You know, I'm, uh, I don't want to glamorize the, the youth use of social media, although I think in many cases, it can be. I mean, we can we can we can realistically point to a lot of the youth use of social media and find really really positive things. Um, I was quite disturbed when my eighth grade daughter came home the other day to say she had been in one of those totally scare tactic internet sessions, kind of the equivalent of the prison visit, right? From from some well-meaning educator, but who came to the school and said, you shouldn't even put your uh, telephone number in an email, kind of at that level. You know, the deep fear of being abducted. Um, and, and I am intrigued that, uh, the, the, that sometimes we don't give youth credit for uh, what they like and want to do, and sometimes in very sophisticated ways, because I've had two children of our four who've actually turned off Facebook for periods of time and said, you know, this just isn't helping me, I don't enjoy it. I need a break. Yeah, uh, Dana. And we treat. We treat. Go ahead. Well, Dana Boyd. Um, she's uh, the researcher. Dana Boyd has done some really interesting work in how how teens do um, how teens do use uh, social tools. And I think that a lot of. I mean, I think that 
there's this notion that somehow teens are sort of sloppy and they don't pay attention to their privacy, but I do think, I mean, they care deeply about it. And I think that they've developed all sorts of tactics um, for protecting or certainly feeling as though they're protecting their privacy online. Um, and I mean, I noticed that with, with my son as well. I mean, I remember that, you know, my son friended me on Facebook, but then quickly made sure I had access to none of his personal information. And I thought, good for him. He knows, you know, he actually is, is aware of the audience that can, uh, that can sort of see what he's doing on, on Facebook. So stats come out from the University of Phoenix. One in particular was really interesting. It was the uh, ethnic diversity of the teachers. Yeah, this the um, the this wasn't a the you know, this was a week where a lot of folks gave out their financial records. But um, the University of Phoenix released what it calls its academic report, and that that struck me as well. That they said that. Um, one third of the faculty at University of Phoenix is non-white and at a much higher rate than other universities. And I, I don't, I mean, I can sort of surmise, I don't know what that means in terms of sort of the, is it the difficulty of um, sort of faculty of color to, to, to get hired, to, to, stay, uh, to stay on board at, at universities? There's something about working in an online scenario that is easier um, in terms of having to not having to sort of deal with um, sort of dealing with racism, I don't know. Or is is it, is it a pay issue? But it certainly it certainly struck me as an interesting an interesting statistic. Yeah, I thought so as well. No, no huge surprise that their enrollments are down, right? Or that a lot of their students don't end up completing their degrees anywhere close to on time if they complete them at all. Right. Yeah. Same old, same old with University of Phoenix. <laughs> So I, I wasn't really tracking the Sailor Open Textbook Challenge. Um, that sounds really fun. No, I, and I, I, I mean, as much as I sort of rail against, you know, as so I sort of railed against textbook, textbooks earlier, I mean, I do think that the, the open textbook is, a, is sort of a different beast, right? Because you are actually able to sort of remix and mash up and, and do interesting things other than just deliver, you know, deliver sort of a static copyrighted pr- digital version of a print bound book and the sailor the sailor foundation has been running a challenge um for folks to uh to create new textbooks and i think that they've just released four and they're they're available to download okay terrific audrey um another interesting week how long did it take you to write that school library journal article um, I did a lot of uh, I did a lot of research. I mean, I I talked to a lot of librarians, which is actually something I love doing. Um, so I'm not sure. It took me a while, but it was it was it's it was fascinating because I think that I don't think we pay close enough attention to sort of actually the on on the ground what has to happen to have any of these tools that we tend to talk about. Actually, what it looks like on the ground implementing this in the classroom is often very different than the sort of the shiny, happy notion that sort of magically everyone is going to have, um, you know, get Chromebooks <laughs> or, or iPads or, or sort of fill in, you know, fill in the, fill in the blank with what, what the, what the tool is. Wait, where, that, uh, you had that in a story this week. It was about the use of uh, Microsoft monies to buy 1400 iPads. <laughs> and then you said something like, well, we all know that iPads are magic. What was it? What was the line? <laughs> <laughs> well, I think that was this was a, what a, a funny irony that this I think it was in uh, in Madison, Wisconsin. The school had a the school district uh, had a pretty substantial settlement settlement against Microsoft, and they were using the money to buy a bunch of iPads. But they weren't actually doing it. I mean, this is a story we've heard before. They aren't actually doing any PD. They aren't actually thinking about what it means to have a technology, a you know, a massive technology implementation. And I said, but that's fine because you know iPads are magic. So, I mean, <laughs> Steve Jobs said, right? It just works. So that's all we that's need to do. Funny. Well, I think you're magic. Thanks for another fun week of <laughs> Thanks, news and information. We'll we'll talk to you next week. That sounds good.